Thank you very much for these uh, kind words of uh, introduction, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back in Dublin. Uh, last time I came to Dublin was uh, half a year ago. Uh, not uh, to address uh, such a distinguished uh, audience, not a numerous audience, but uh, only uh, two members of the new appointed government at that point in time, very distinguished uh, politicians. Um, uh, and um, last time I was here at the Institute, I think it was five, year, five years ago, uh, a few weeks after uh, I joined uh, the executive board of the, of, the, uh, of the ECB. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are very challenging times for you here in, in Ireland, but also for us in Frankfurt, uh, and I think for all governments uh, in uh, the European Union, and in particular in the, uh, in the Euro area. Uh, very challenging times um, uh, with this sovereign debt crisis, um, which has re-intensified, uh, I, I must say, and uh, now spreading um, uh, over to, the, um, to other countries of the Euro area, including, as we have seen uh, last week, since last week, also to um, um, so-called core countries uh, of, the, of the Euro area. This is a new uh, phenomenon. However, let me add um, already from the outset that um, the um, fiscal crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, is not only um, concentrated um, in, uh, in Europe. All advanced economies, um, or most of the advanced economies, are facing serious problems uh, in, their, in their public uh, debt, in high deficits, uh, close to the double digits, or uh, with debt to GDP ratios um, uh, which uh, have exploded uh, since um, uh, 2008, 2009, on average, by uh, 25 to 30 percent of GDP. In some cases, uh, more than 40 percent of GDP. And now, uh, countries that um, uh, run a debt to GDP ratio of about 40 or 45 percent in 2007 today run a, a debt to GDP ratio of 85% or even 100% advanced economies, apart from Japan, not to mention Japan, because Japan is a special case with a debt to GDP ratio of 220%. Uh, so this is um, an, an issue for all um, advanced um, uh, economies uh, to address this uh, challenge and uh, to uh, pursue politics, um, uh, policies um, in order uh, to, um, uh, to um, assure the sustainability of, um, of the debt. At the same time, we see in continental Europe that um, uh, investors uh, are reassessing their exposure uh, in sovereign debt, uh, and um, uh, we see a process, an ongoing process of deleveraging so maybe we are facing um, at present, uh, let me say, a paradigm shift uh, as far as public debt is concerned, a paradigm shift in a way uh, that uh, the debt tolerance is declining and that investors uh, have a closer look to the underlying economic fundamentals in respective countries uh, before they invest uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, these, in these countries. At the same time, ladies and gentlemen, the longer this sovereign debt crisis lasts, um, the um, more likely uh, will be negative spillovers uh, to the uh, real economy, uh, in particular via the confidence channel. And uh, for this reason, I, I have to say, it be this, this um, sovereign debt crisis is mainly uh, a, so uh, a, confidence, a confidence crisis. A confidence crisis um, uh, in a way that um, financial market tens tensions have unfavorable effects on the financing, uh, on financing conditions and on confidence. And all this is likely to dampen economic growth in the near term, um, if not in the, in the medium term. The second, um, that um, there is a lack of confidence in the sustainability of public debt. Third, uh, that um, uh, a lack of confidence in the ability of politicians uh, to uh, uh, do the right things and to do the right things right. Um, and finally, there are increasing fears about longer term, uh, longer term impact 
of the sovereign debt crisis on uh, economic growth uh, and on uh, jobs. Now, very briefly on the global situation where we stand at present, um, uh, globally we see strong headwinds um, uh, for the global economy, uh, which uh, continue to resta restrain uh, the recovery. Uh, in particular, again, in the advanced economies, we still see, see still strong growth in emerging market economies uh, and um, global growth is mainly driven by emerging market uh, economies with very strong growth. Uh, and um, according to international institutions, um, global economic, uh, the global economic activity um, will grow by around 4% in 2011 and a bit less uh, in 2012. At the same time, the world trade volume um, will grow around 7% uh, this year, uh, but um, again will uh, grow a bit slower in 2012. This according to international institutions um, in their projections or forecast. All in all, what we can say about the global activity uh, is that global activity is moderating uh, and uh, all in all that world trade uh, dynamics uh, remain weak. For the euro area, uh, GDP growth is expected uh, to be very moderate in the second half of 2011. However, the third quarter surprised uh, many people on the upside um, uh, with uh, strong growth uh, in France and uh, in Germany. Um, but we expect um, stronger dampening effects in the fourth quarter uh, 2011, uh, taking into account uh, the uh, the heterogeneity across uh, euro area member states. Uh, we have very heterogeneous picture as far as economic activity is um, concerned. Now, um, the um, strong dampening effects in the fourth quarter are based uh, are due to the uh, dampening um, underlying growth momentum with a moderation in pace um, of global demand, the negative impact uh, of the overall financing conditions, uh, as I said already, resulting from the ongoing uh, sovereign debt crisis, uh, but there are still positive signs coming from the emerging market economies um, and um, even if they uh, most recently have seen some, um, some uh, weakening or some decline in economic activity. However, this is in the context of um, uh, the signs of overheating uh, a welcome uh, development. Now, since um, the, the uh, uh, publication of the um, projections of our staff uh, two months, uh, two and a half months ago for the euro area, the survey data have become more unfavorable and um, um, previously identified downside risks to economic growth have materialized uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, and um, for this reason, um, international institutions um, and organizations, but also European institutions have significantly revised downward their uh, GDP um, uh, growth forecast for 2012. Uh, it is now in the range between 0.6 and 0.8%. Uh, um, however, based on the <clears throat> most recent information, our staff at the ECB expect um, not a, a, a longer term um, a weakening in economic ac activity, but expect a temporary, the soft patch as, by definition, as a temporary uh, phenomenon. Uh, so all the discussion uh, about um, uh, recession, uh, I must say, we have to, we should avoid to talk ourselves uh, into, a, uh, into a recession. Uh, there are many questions uh, raised in the newspapers, uh, whether the global economy is facing um, a double dip um, uh, is it true that um, the Europeans, the continental Europeans, uh, are responsible uh, for uh, the um, uh, slowdown in the economic recovery in the United Kingdom and in the United States? I think all these countries have their particular uh, problems. Um, uh, so, um, like in the housing market, with unemployment and with the uh, in some cases with a lack of um, the fiscal consolidation strategy. Very briefly on the price developments, um, 
In October, we had an inflation rate in the euro area as a whole, on average, uh, at uh, 3%. However, we say this, is, this belongs to the past. We are, in our monetary policy, we are forward-looking. And um, all the projections um, of international and private institutions and organizations uh, point to a, a deceleration in uh, inflation uh, that uh, for 2012, um, but also those who uh, make available projections already for 2013, uh, we see in this or this projection horizon um, wait, uh, moderation in inflation in line with what we have defined as price stability uh, in, in, the, in the ECB. And uh, we have to expect a um, uh, decline in the inflation rate um, in the course of 2012 um, simply because of base effects um, uh, reflecting the strong increase in commodity prices uh, in, the, in the first uh, quarter uh, of this uh, year. Again, we, have, um, we are facing uh, heterogeneity across um, member states. Now, the fiscal situation, I mentioned already, um, this is the key, the key point. Um, however, let me say, uh, all advanced economies have to carry out um, uh, <clears throat> uh, fiscal consolidation uh, measures uh, to bring the deficit and the debt-to-GDP ratio under control. Without any correction, the debt-to-GDP ratio will increase in the euro area in the year 2020 to 120 percent, on average, in the euro area. In the, according to our uh, estimates in the United States, it will increase to 150% of GDP until 2020, and uh, in Japan to 260%. So you see there is um, an urgent need uh, for fiscal uh, consolidation. Uh, however, at present, the euro area is uh, in, in the focus, um, and it is more than just if the fiscal uh, situation. It is also the structural weaknesses um, some countries are facing, um, some countries uh, which have lost uh, um, price competitiveness um, uh, since they, uh, then they joined the, the euro. Uh, and <clears throat> as I mentioned already, the fisc this fiscal outlook uh, for the euro area is also a threat uh, to the economic outlook and for this reason decisive and front-loaded um, action is needed to bolster uh, public confidence in the sustainability uh, of um, government finances. And this is vital not only for the program countries, um, uh, Greece, uh, Ireland, Portugal. This is vital for all member states of the uh, euro area. The reasons for the explosion of public debt um, are well known. Um, in many cases, the starting point was um, not um, uh, a good one, not a positive one. It was different in Ireland, uh, starting from a very low level of debt-to-GDP ratio. But uh, like in other countries, uh, the support of the, uh, of the financial system, the, um, um, the automatic stabilizers, which worked during the economic crisis, and the fiscal stimuli in 2009 and 2010 led to this situation in, uh, in the debt to GDP debt, uh, ratio and um, the um, uh, deficit. And those countries were hit hardest with um, large or, let me say, overextended uh, financial uh, sector and unsound fiscal positions already before the crisis. So for this reason, fiscal consolidation, let me stress it again, is um, indispensable and it has to go hand in hand uh, with the structural reforms um, in order to return to, um, to levels um, which are uh, sustainable. Now, in the case of Ireland, uh, I must say that um, the fiscal consolidation is in line with uh, the program. Uh, there are good news, uh, I must say, um, and uh, what uh, has been done and what is still required is the rigorous implementation, um, uh, which um, are the rigorous implementation in line with the program, but also in line with the excessive uh, deficit uh, procedure. The second point I would like to stress that um, um, Ireland was successful in uh, completing the recapitalization uh, and uh, in the ongoing deleveraging of the, of the banking uh, system of domestic banks. Uh, and the restructuring of domestic banks is progressing. 
and third, um, the action plan on uh, uh, market reform, on labor market reform, product market reform, uh, has um, made significant uh, prog progress. And we see now a significant improvement uh, in the uh, uh, market um, perception, which led to a, a strong decline in the uh, in the uh, in the spreads in the and the and sovereign and sovereign bonds. Um, so it, uh, I, I must say, it is worth to try to be ahead of the curve and to implement uh, the program as um, uh, fully in line with the uh, with the timetable which has been agreed upon. Uh, and I think this, in the end, uh, shows positive uh, results. Also positive results as far as the GDP growth is concerned in the first half of 2011. I think you are all aware what um, happened here. Growth was, was, growth was faster uh, than uh, expected um, due to strong uh, uh, export growth. Uh, net export made a main contribution to, the, uh, to GDP growth in the first half of 2011. Uh, uh, 11. And this is due to the fact that there was a correction in the unit labor cost, a strong decline uh, in, uh, in unit labor cost, so adjustment process also in this, uh, in this field. All in all, I must say, uh, Ireland, um, the Irish economy has stabilized, and in this respect, the EU IMF program has helped to stabilize the um, uh, Irish um, uh, economy. Uh, and um, uh, I must say this is, can be, this should be a role model also for other countries which are under program. And the Irish case clearly demonstrates it is feasible, it is possible to uh, implement the program as long as there is support in the society and as long as there is, in principle, a consensus across the political parties. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, this role model from coming from Ireland uh, also will help to overcome the still uh, ongoing uh, problems uh, in the new uh, Greek uh, government. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as far as the economic adjustment in the monetary union is uh, concerned, we are facing in the monetary union not only the fiscal imbalances, but also the uh, current account uh, imbalances, uh, deficits uh, which were run in many countries of the euro area on the one hand, on the other side, uh, surpluses. However, not all, in all cases, the deficit uh, of um, uh, current account deficit in one country is due to the surplus. Uh, of, um, uh, of the current account in another country. This depends on the structure of the economy, uh, the export orientation of the economy, the scope of products that are, um, uh, are exported um, uh, to which uh, no other advanced economy might uh, have, uh, 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 might compete with. So I think we have to, this is a very complex issue which, have, which we have to take uh, into account. Now, uh, the point I would like to make is that uh, macroeconomic imbalances um, and unsustainable fiscal policies are the root of the current sovereign debt crisis we are facing uh, in, the, in the euro area. And the existing economic governance framework has not been able uh, to prevent the emergence of excessive macroeconomic imbalances. And moreover, the fiscal policy coordination uh, in the euro area turned out to be completely insufficient. Some countries have built up uh, significant internal and uh, external imbalances uh, during the past decade and recorded uh, inflation rates persistently uh, above uh, the euro area average. So for instance, the uh, euro area average accumula accumulated uh, from 1999 to 2010 and inflation was 26.5%. So year by year, accumulated uh, from 99 to 2010, 26.5%. However, in the case of Greece, we had an inflation accumulated of 46.9%. Uh, in the case of, um, of Ireland, 34.6%. Um, uh, in the case of uh, Portugal, 33.8%. In the case of um, uh, France, only 23.1% and the case of Germany, 19.8, over 11, uh, 11 years. So a clear 
picture, hetero very heterogeneous picture uh, across uh, the euro area uh, member states. And um, we have, from the, from the side of the ECB, time and again warned against this heterogeneity uh, because we are operating under a single exchange rate of the euro area. So this uh, inflation differentials cannot anymore be uh, compensated or corrected uh, by adjustment uh, of, the, of the exchange rate. I come back to this point uh, uh, immediately. Uh, we have warned against this uh, emerging imbalances at an early point in time, but um, from the political point of view, from the side of the governments, there was no urgency to address these emerging uh, imbalances. Now, increases in labor compensation in some countries, uh, driven in most cases by high public sector wage increases, uh, exceeded uh, productivity, which uh, led to a, a significant increase in uh, unit um, labor cost. Uh, and unit labor cost growth uh, for, per annum uh, from 1999 uh, to 2010 uh, stood increase at 3.5%. So annual increase in unit labor cost, 3.5% uh, increase. Uh, in uh, uh, Spain, 2.5%. In Ireland, 2.6%. The average of the euro area, unit labor cost increase per annum was 1.6%. Again, reflecting this... Uh, significant heterogeneity across um, uh, countries. And also not to forget the, um, the fact that um, the low interest rate environment, um, but also um, a very, let me say, uh, expansionary fiscal policy uh, allowed for an increase in the indebtedness. Uh, in Ireland, less so in the public sector, the, we had a strong or a substantial reduction in the debt to GDP ratio until 2007, but um, a sharp increase in the indebtedness of the corporate sector uh, to 204 percent of uh, euro area of the of the Irish GDP, uh, and the private households to 120.8 percent of the Irish GDP, compared to the euro area average of 104.6 on the corporate sector and 65.8. Uh, in, the, uh, in the household sector. These are figures for 2009. And all in all, the private and public debt summed up until 2009 to 389% of Irish GDP, and the euro area average stood at 249. You see a significant difference. So 104%, 40% of GDP difference between the euro area average and uh, Ireland. And at a certain point in time, you must consider this is not a sustainable path. Uh, at one point in time, this has to be corrected. Uh, the, the issue is how and when. Abrupt or more smoothly, a soft landing or hard landing. After a boom, a bust, or how to deal with the boom, and in particular, the question for the future, how to avoid boom and bust uh, in future. Is this feasible to avoid boom and bust uh, in, in the future uh, in any case? Now, many factors um, uh, contributed to these uh, developments, uh, including unrealistically optimistic expectations uh, about uh, future income developments uh, and the underestimation of um, credit risks by financial uh, institutions. And not only credit risk by financial institutions. In general, we, we have to say that one of the main reasons for this financial and economic crisis, which ended up in a sovereign debt crisis, was the inappropriate pricing of risk until 2007. The undershooting um, by market, market, market participants in the pricing of risk, and now we might see the opposite, uh, that markets move in the other direction with an overshooting uh, in the pricing uh, of risk. Uh, and this is very likely will, will, stay, very likely will stay uh, with us for some, for some time. A key factor was that wage and income policies were not, as I said already, sufficiently geared towards um, preserving competitiveness in a monetary union, and uh, governments failed to address structural, um, structural uh, uh, rigidities in the euro area economies. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, there were countries and governments which have not adjusted to the conditions of a monetary union. 
They just entered the third stage of monetary union in 1999 without changing their economic policy. They qualified according to the, to the Maastricht um, uh, convergence criteria. They qualified for monetary union. In the end, this was also a political decision. Who qualified uh, for, for monetary union? And also, again, political decisions who qualified later on when we extended uh, the uh, number of member states um, adopting uh, the, the, the euro. But um, there were, not all countries were prepared for this situation, to deal with the, with the situation in which important adjustment instruments uh, are no longer available. And we know that um, for economic adjustment, uh, in general, there are three prices available, the exchange rate, the interest rate, and uh, costs, or let's say wages. And, and by nature, in a monetary union, the first two prices, namely exchange rate <laughs> and um, the interest rate, are set for the euro area, for the monetary union as a whole. But these instruments are no longer available at the national level. So for this reason, this requires um, additional, uh, additional or other, uh, other um, instruments to make the economy more flexible. Now, the, what does the monetary union mean in terms of adjustment channels? Uh, monetary union in this respect means the, that the nominal exchange rate is no longer available. So those components contributing to the real exchange rate are the components or are the elements or the instruments which are still uh, available. And this means um, uh, that key conditions for an adjustment in a monetary union are uh, price flexibility, factor mobility, in particular uh, labor, and fiscal transfers. Now, the uh, price flexibility is important in order to let countries affected uh, by adverse economic shocks uh, recover by adjusting wages and um, reducing relative prices uh, in order to rebuild competitiveness. The second adjustment mechanism, the cross-border factor uh, mobility, or in particular labor mobility, helps to adjust to adverse shocks as people move out of the depressed economy until it regains competitiveness uh, and the labor market in the country finds a new equilibrium. A third adjustment mechanism uh, identified uh, in the literature is fiscal transfers. Uh, flowing from the stronger countries or from the economically uh, stronger regions uh, to the weaker parts of a monetary union. Although these uh, instruments um, um, are often referred to as being substitutes, uh, they are uh, in fact not. The first two, price flexibility and um, factor mobility, are important uh, to solve um, the problem facing a country affected by an adverse shock. The third one, the fiscal transfers, only hides uh, the problem. The temporary transfers can play uh, a stabilizing role, uh, and may be needed, um, subject to strict uh, conditionality, if a country is affected by a very serious adverse shock. Open-ended, so long-lasting transfers, however, are not a mode of adjustment. And in fact, they are the opposite. The finance, they finance non-adjustment. Let me remind you of a declaration which was agreed by the European finance ministers on the 1st of May 1998. And the 1st of May 1998, the European finance ministers, followed by the heads of state and government, um, agreed um, on the countries um, which started uh, with the, to move to the, to, which moved to the third stage of EMU. And there was a declaration uh, accompanying the Council's recommendation on the member states participating uh, in economic and monetary union. And this declaration was uh, endorsed or improved by the heads of state and government uh, at the European Council in, uh, uh, in, in, in Cardiff in, in June 1998. 
I quote, without prejudice to the objectives and provisions of the treaty, it is agreed that economic and monetary union as such cannot be invoked to justify specific financial transfers. This is a clear statement, uh, and uh, the author of this sentence is uh, by accident in this room today. So, um, no transfers, um, um, temporary loans based on strict conditionality. This is exactly <coughs> what um, the EU IMF programs uh, are about, adjustment uh, with the, the, the support uh, of the European partners uh, adjustment with the support of the international community uh, represented by the International Monetary Fund. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the key adjustment mechanism in a monetary union is price and wage flexibility. And this was known already in 1998, uh, before the start of the, of the third stage uh, of, of EMU, but it was not, maybe it was, it was forgotten or not uh, internalized uh, by all governments um, or uh, parliaments at the, at the national level. And wages and prices are essential for country adjustments as they uh, directly impact uh, on the real exchange rate and thus on a country's competitiveness. In fact, wages and prices are, by definition, the only remaining component of the real exchange rate and can be adjusted in the absence of nominal exchange rate uh, flexibility. So, um, having referred to the need for adjustment at the national level, I said that at the supranational level, the um, economic governance agreed uh, in the with the Maastricht Treaty and later on with the Stability and Growth Pact had failed. This um, uh, economic governance um, has failed because it um, never was fully applied. Uh, it was watered down uh, in between 2003 and 2005, uh, when in particular Germany and France insisted that the next step in the application of the Stability and Growth Pact um, not to take place. Uh, the result was the reform of the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, but the reform in the not in the right direction. It, tot it went totally in the wrong direction, and there was at that point in time uh, a political attempt to destroy the fiscal rules. But we need fiscal rules because with monetary union, we have not engaged, we have not embarked in a fully fledged federation in Europe. And as long as this is the case, part of the so called political union must be fiscal rules. And this was the idea why, why, why already in the Maastricht Treaty fiscal rules were incorporated and more specified later on in, with the Stability and Growth Pact. However, it has not worked. Now lessons have been learned from this um, bad experience with an enhanced Stability and Growth Pact on the one hand and with a new procedure which is the macroeconomic surveillance um, uh, procedure uh, in order to identify at an early stage emerging imbalances uh, at the country level or, um, and or uh, at the European level. So we see th some progress here. Uh, after the summer break, there was an agreement reached between the European Commission, the European Parliament, and um, uh, the, um, uh, the European finance ministers, uh, the so-called six-pack. This is a big step forward. In our view, in the view of the ECB, this is not far-reaching enough, uh, so we should draw firmer conclusions uh, from this uh, crisis. And in this respect, um, the so-called review clause, which is part of the agreement between the three institutions, um, provides um, uh, uh, an important uh, element and should enable further enhancements uh, in economic governance and um, contribute to a smoother functioning of economic and uh, monetary union. Now let me conclude. Um, times are likely to remain challenging for all of us. Um, the crisis is not over yet. Uh, I will not make any forecast um, uh, when it will be over. 
Um, I hope that the worst to be over in, uh, let's say, when I have left uh, office, um, but this is not, uh, this is not, um, there's no casualty. Um, um, uh, so um, uh, maybe in two years from now, difficult to predict. Um, I will not um, make any prediction in this respect. Uh, I said already over lunch that um, uh, about half a year ago, I was asked when it is over. And I said, okay, uh, it seems as if the um, most challenging time is over and it turned out to be wrong. So this will be very, this will again be very demanding times for all of us. Um, uh, it will take time to overcome this crisis. Uh, however, the crisis will have also medium to longer term effects, um, medium to longer term effects uh, on economic activity, on growth potential, very likely on growth potential. We have to reconsider what is the growth model of the future after growth models in some countries with um, um, characterized by uh, low interest rate, persistently low interest rate and increasing indebtedness uh, as this growth model has, uh, has failed and um, uh, leaving behind um, a high fiscal burden uh, for the next generation and maybe for a very long time. Uh, period of time, maybe for more than one generation. Uh, and we also have to discuss the role of the financial sector in the future. What is the role of the financial sector in the future in supporting the real economy? What is uh, evident um, uh, and what is very likely is that economic shocks um, are a fact of life uh, and uh, countries should be prepared to deal with uh, uh, them. And this is all the more the case in a monetary union where the nominal exchange rate uh, is no longer available as an instrument of adjustment. The challenges uh, that some euro area countries currently face underline the critical importance of strong adjustment mechanisms and the need to avoid macroeconomic imbalances and unsustainable uh, fiscal policies. This all underlines the responsibility of um, national economic um, policy makers and uh, this brings me to a very important conclusion, namely stability begins at home and we all have to put our own house uh, in order uh, before we give advice uh, to others. All in all, strong economic adjustment mechanisms not only help to absorb adverse shocks, but they are also essential to re the benefits of our single currency, the euro. Thank you very much.